Chapman and the Board of Trustees of the Center for Black Culture and International Understanding on the occasion of this grand celebration of 55 years of exhibiting and promoting traditional and contemporary African arts by Chief Dr. Nike Okundai. I'm truly honored to speak about a woman I've come to know quite closely, a woman of great value and a mother. I belong to a long line of daughters that Mama has impacted throughout her career as an artist. Mama is someone you fall in love with the moment you set your eyes on her. Her humility, kindness, and great sense of humor are sources of endearment to us. I also like to thank the team of artists exhibiting their works today and the entire art community that has upheld our culture over several decades. In this great city of Oshogo, known for the uniqueness of its art and culture, and more importantly, for sustaining the Oshu Oshogo Festival and the art of fabric dyeing. So I greet all of you, the great people of Oshogo. I have titled today's presentation, Nike Okundae, the quintessential artist and philanthropist. And I do not intend to, have a very, to make a very long uh, presentation today. Already many people know about her biography, so I'm gonna skip that, but to mention that she was brought up by strong women. She lost her mother when she was six years uh, old, and of course she was brought up by her grandmother and great-grandmother, and uh, this is quite significant. But she also talks about the fact that uh, as a young girl, she was made to do a lot of household chores and other work she considered very tedious, such as ginning cotton used in weaving fabrics on the loom. Nike is popularly known today as Mama Nike, an endearment that signifies age, respect, and accomplishment. Sometimes she's referred to as uh, Nike Davis or Nike Oladi or Nike Twin Seven Seven. And the last few decades as Nike Okundae and not Nike Davis Okundae. Um, my reference to these names is to show how women are culturally labeled or continue to bear the burden of carrying on names long after relationships may have ended. Men do not suffer this sort of um, framing. They move on bearing no labels to previous engagements and as such appear to be better referenced in this regard. Mama Nike is an epitome of resilience, a woman who has gone through many travails, first as a young girl and later as a woman, to emerge as one of the most successful artists in Africa. Like gold wrought through uh, fire, Nike has over the years acquired a sheen and glow and has come to be admired and respected for her steadfastness, doggedness, and amiable personality. Earlier, she was more recognized as a batik or textile artist. She learned how to weave on the loom, to do embroidery, and produce hand-designed cassava resist patterns on fabric. In this presentation, we intend to touch on various aspects of Nike Okundai's life as a distinguished artist and entrepreneur, an advocate for women's rights, and a great art administrator. We will get to see a range of multi- talents and how she has over the years woken up these exceptional skills in carrying out her various projects throughout her career. Nike Okundaye is genuinely much more than a textile artist. She also does huge mosaics as we saw when we saw the images on the screen and paintings besides making embroidery, quilts and costumes. She's also an art administrator, dancer, a singer and philanthropist. We'll look at some of the literary texts that focus on the artist and finally contextualize her art within the broader framework of textile production in Nigeria. So we'll take a look at just three texts. Uh, one of them was published in 1991 uh, by Betty LaDuke and it's titled Africa Through the Eyes of Women Artists. And this uh, study discusses women artists from uh, both Africa and the African diaspora. And she's discussed alongside two other artists uh, Elizabeth Olu and Susan Wenger, that you all know. Like the other two artists, an entire chapter was dedicated to her, to her life and her art. The author, Betty LaDuke, being an artist herself, 
uh, provided valuable information about Nikkei's work, particularly those that were done uh, in the late 1980s. The second text by Kim Marivaz, titled The Woman and the Artistic Brush, A Life History of Yoruba Batik Artist, Nikkei Davis, was published in 1995. And as, uh, as the title suggests, the author seems to have focused on her early history and her struggles, and she provides insights into how she navigated her polygamous marriage. However, Nikkei rose to encourage her co-wives to become economically independent to overcome the challenges of being subservient to their husbands in a way that dehumanized them. So then we have the third text, which is by, uh, Nick, by Kofo Adeleke, which was published in 2020, and it gives us a more detailed um, view of um, Nikkei's art. And I'm not going to go into the details of it for time, but also to mention that there are other publications that have come out of the Nikkei Arts Foundation, and there's a lot you can find and glean from social media, from Instagram, from Facebook, and they tell us about, I mean, they provide a continuous flow of information about Nikkei's activities across, uh, I mean, worldwide. So in, in terms of education, uh, we find that uh, she is not learned in the way that we expect. But we sometimes say that um, because she dropped out of school, uh, she's, she has no formal education, but she herself also says that, me, Kawe. And I want to say this because she is very learned in the sense that she understands the language and the culture of Yoruba people and she understands the nuances of the culture as well. And she's steeped in Yoruba philosophical thoughts and understands the value of indigenous knowledge systems. And therefore, Mama Nike is very well educated. So I also say this because in recognizing indigenous knowledge, the value of indigenous knowledge, she has also sent her daughter, her first daughter, to study still dancing uh, in Ibarakpa. And this reminds us of another um, scholar, late uh, Sikini Olusoyi, an African-American scholar of theater arts who lived in Ibadan. And she taught her daughter to study Ifa systems for several years, and she was sent to learn all of this. And so this is very important for us to you know, draw from our culture and to help in sustaining it. So in terms of textile and establishing a textile museum, I also talked about her legacy and her collection of African textiles. And to say that she has perhaps the largest and most diverse collection of textiles in Nigeria. And the, other, the only other collection that I've seen uh, is that of Simidele Ogunsoya, the founder of uh, My Dream Gallery in Lagos. And they are referred to their collection of Asho Ufi. So Nikkei's textile collection emphasizes the need for a national collection of textiles in what should be ex exclusively a textile museum to show and preserve the rich and diverse variety of textiles across the continent. So Nikkei adorns herself with textiles as a wearable art form. Her boo-boos and kaftans are so elaborately done that they appear like paintings. Some of these are figurative and decorative and can stand alone as art forms in their own right. So I move on to talking about her appearance, her gele gala. <laughs> and that's the name that Walesh uh, Ingai gives to these very extensive sculptural uh, headgears that she, she wears. And indeed, these are quite interesting. They have different shapes and sizes. Elsewhere, I've talked about it in great extent. I am actually jumping so that I can meet time. And to also mention that the gallery space that she has in Lagos has been described as um, a palace. Uh, she has this, I mean, the most ultra-modern space for showing art in Nigeria. And one of the uh, very renowned scholars, Oyewumi Oyerunke, a renowned Nigerian scholar based in the US, uh, and a very frequent visitor to Nikkei Arts Gallery uh, describes her place as a palace and in fact describes her as a king, as an oba. And I quote, the variety of people and the multifarious activities around her is similar to what goes on in a traditional palace. It, it suggests a microcosm of the ilu, the ancestral town, the drumming, the praise singing, the entertainment, drinking, dancing, and eating. The palace is the center and the focal point and the energy that comes with it. Nikkei's foundation functions as a magnet that draws people from far and near. A palace does that and everything flows from the Oba 
end of quotes. So, Obanike has set up a structure that draws important guests to Lagos. Several ambassadors and their guests visit the arts gallery. It is one place to visit for all uh, visitors to the, to the city. And it has featured several times in international media. And if you go to the gallery on Sunday, you are bound to be fetid. You have very sumptuous meals served you. And you have the opportunity of um, interacting with guests from across the globe in her center. And of course, we know that she has about four centers set up in Oshogbo, Lagos, Ogidi, and Abuja. And recently, the one in Abuja, an edifice was put up uh, recently. So I'm going to skip style and talk about her philanthropy, a very generous person. Uh, during the last one of the panel sessions dedicated to her at the Lagos Studies Association meeting, every panel member had something that she had gifted them. And at some, at some point, people in the audience also lifted bags or scarves or clothing that uh, Nikkei had given them at one time or the other. So Nikkei is a giver. And of course, she has supported female artists, particularly the Association of Female Artists, by giving them, uh, giving them um, avenue to exhibit their works in a space for free. So in terms of continuity, we know that her children have taken to the art. Her first daughter in the US uh, runs a lot of workshops and is a damn good singer and uh, performer, uh, combining the talents of her parents, Twin 77 and Nike, and also her daughter, Aino Davis, who runs the Adria Pattern Art Workshop in Lekki. So the last part of my presentation looks at the future of African textiles and raises questions about the sustainability of textiles and the fashion industry. And so I look at the way and manner in which she has sustained this tradition of extracting uh, blue dye from green leaves, and also to say that she has passed on the skill to several, several artists. But there are questions that arise from this. Where are the vast fields of the indigo plants we read about that were in Oshobo? Where are the cotton fields or cotton uh, farms that once provided cotton, not just for the local market, but were exported to Europe through Portuguese middlemen in the 16th century? How do we return to that glorious past? In Oyo State, there's a young entrepreneur and farmer, Helen Omawumi Oduyemi, who has begun the Oyo Cotton Initiative, creating and building clusters of farmers in Igbeti and Ido to introduce them to farming cotton and using state-of-the-art technology to increase yield and make meaningful projections. But where are the generates and investors who can transform this cotton into textiles in Nigeria? If we have mechanized generates, then we can eliminate the tedious process of hand ginning that Nike had to go through as a daily chore when she was uh, growing up. Today, there's a huge market for countries that export cotton to Nigeria. The production in Nigeria today cannot serve the demand of local craftsmen who resort to using dead stock materials, factory rejects, and expensive options to serve as canvas for their creative exploration. The ease of using chemical dyes and the spontaneous results makes it very popular amongst today's dyes. Therefore, the laborious process of extracting dye, the indigo dye, as practiced by Yoruba and Hausa dyers, has been jettisoned for these new chemicals that are disposed of indiscriminately into our waterways and have injurious consequences on the environment as well as on the user. Adira Eleko is a wonderful creation of Yoruba artists. It is a part of our indigenous knowledge that, has, that should be preserved and celebrated by all and not left to Nike alone. Yet in many workshops, this technique is less commonly done than the batik or other methods. One of the reasons textile designers give uh, for not making Adire Eleko is that it requires much more space to spread out the fabric for stenciling and also for drying. It can only be done effectively, largely during the uh, dry season. I'm excited that it tells us about our food culture, the use of cassava starch as resist, the use of food, which is lafum, as art material, and also tells us about the things that we use, the paraphernalia for cooking, the mortar and the pistol, the kiln, and all the things that we use for extracting dyes. So in giving tribute to Nike, I also recognize all the textile designers in Ushubu and beyond who have carried on projecting our rich cultural heritage. I remember the works of Georgina Bai and Susan Wenger. 
and the workshops they organized that provided skills for local artists from the 1950s, and also the works of late Ari Wamboje of Blessed Memory, whose large uh, screen prints on textile inspired the works of Ademola Williams and many others uh, in Ife, Oshobo, and Bedin. And more recently, artists like Ayo Olatu Bosu, a textile graduate of OAU, whose contemporary designs on fabric and ready to wear reach out to global audiences beyond Abekuta, where he works and lives. Regarding scholarship, I would also like to recognize Professor um, Babase Inde Ademuleya, also Professor Areo Gomisola and Pat Oilola, whose writings on Adjure and Ashofi have been very enriching. There has been other inspiring research by people like Pamela Eguare and Umana Unnachuri, whose practices as artists attempt to decolonize knowledge concerning textiles. And if I haven't mentioned your name, it is not because you are doing anything less. I haven't also mentioned my name. Today is a day of celebrating your talents, celebrating Mama, and I'm going to end by saying Mama Nike, Oba Nike, happy birthday. Thank you for listening. <laughs>